So good evening, welcome to the fourth session uh, of lectures and discussion this year. Our topic this year, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Our topic this year is the studio. The studio is often seen as the physical surrogate, surrogate of the artist's mind and the site of the original, unique, and authentic artistic endeavor. And it is the stage of artistic self-representation. Uh, in 1966, Ellen Capro, I mean, it has changed a lot during the second half of the 20th century. In 1966, for example, uh, Ellen Capro wrote, I quote, the romance of the atelier, like the gallery and museum, will probably disappear in time. But meanwhile, the rest of the world has become endlessly available. You know that it has not totally disappeared, none of these institutions. And uh, what we uh, discussed uh, in the, uh, I will just tell you very briefly what we already discussed in the first three sections of lectures, lectures and discussions. The first was about the history and current relevancy of the studio and John Wood, a great and art historian from Leeds, talked about the history of the studio uh, since the 19th century, and Katharina Gross, an artist from uh, Berlin, uh, who has a very big studio and her own studio and living house she built, talked about her studio practice. The second uh, topic was The City is Our Factory, and it dealt with the city as production space. Niels Boeing, for example, talked about new collective production spaces in big cities and Ashok Sukumaran, an Indian artist, part of a camp, you might have seen his work at the documenta, talked about the vicarious city, a city seen through media, like a film where you see the city in a train going through the city. And the third topic was political interventions and working in collectives. Um, and we had uh, examples from various parts of the world, like the Voina group, uh, in R Russia uh, showed us their um, artistic practice, or VHV, the curatorial group from Zagreb talked about their collective curatorial practice, and also Tanya Bruguera, who had a course, gave a course at the Summer Academy, talked about her collective performances in, uh, one collective performance in Havana. Uh, today we have the Global Local Studio, uh, and it is, uh, in a way, continuing our topic of last year's symposium called Global Art, where we ask what is, is there something like global art? And today we will uh, ask also what, what could be a global and local studio. And uh, on August 21st, there's the last session called Getting Out of the Traditional Studio. I want to thank Bärbel Hartje, with whom I uh, did the concept for this series of lectures and who did all the managing of uh, these events and the technicians here and also the translators who have a very hard work to do um, and will help you, those who uh, speak better German than English, to understand uh, this evening. I want to present very briefly Georg Schöllhammer. He is moderating tonight. He is the founding editor of Springerin, Hefte zur Kunst, and a freelance writer and curator. And I would like to thank everybody on the panel to be, and I'm looking forward to this very exciting evening. <laughs> Thank you, Hildegund. Actually, when uh, uh, you invited me, Babel, and you to uh, moderate a panel on the studio, I thought, oh, the studio, isn't this a notion that's so totally outworn? And then I looked a bit into the recent exhibition and publishing practices, and I found out that it's not outworn at all. And there is a lot of uh, debate thinking and uh, considering uh, this uh, strange cage of making, as uh, uh, Mr. Nafordan put it once. And I was thinking about why that might, why that might be, uh, not just because of the, uh, so to say, the uh, life and world of artistic production has changed dramatically, and there is still a need to, to figure around something like Heidegger would have said, 
ein Ort, an dem man sich sozusagen sammelt, uh, ein Haus, there's something like a house where you can recollect all that fragmented uh, practice that, that is around. On the other hand, I was thinking about that uh, it might have to do a bit with the uh, world that we are living in and uh, that world is roughly characterized by uh, most of them who criticize the current affairs uh, with the term neoliberalism, where you find a lot of practices around in the producing world and in the world of economy and in the world of factories and there, so to say, uh, entities of production and thinking that have a lot uh, in common with uh, the debates uh, on the studio and the artist studio, not just of the Renaissance, where it was really something like a workshop, but uh, as it developed in the 19th century. So I'm very, very proud to have this subject around, uh, to, to be able to moderate around this subject, and very proud to be able to uh, introduce uh, uh, such uh, an honorable, uh, uh, actually, table here that uh, I'm sure we'll be able to talk about this strange uh, thing that we are again uh, asked to talk, namely the local and the global uh, of the studio. I, uh, well, if you think about maybe the high times of the studio uh, as uh, departing from the workshop as a unit of artistic production where arts really try, got their own uh, 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 practice uh, as a practice that is an institute within bourgeois society. And if you remember, for instance, just, just a few of the studio pictures that famous artists gave, uh, I found out, just, remember, just thinking about three when I considered, that this uh, strange dialectics of the local and the global already somehow is uh, visible in these uh, f uh, examples. If you think, for instance, about Vermeer's famous studio picture, uh, which is an allegory, for sure, it's not an allegory just of artistic production, and the, pro uh, and the, the figure of the artist in the world of colonialism, it is an allegory, so to say, of the colonies itself. If you don't think just about this artistic scene that is displayed, the, the model and the, uh, and the painter that is, uh, and, and the light that is always the, the main subject in Vermeer. You, if you look a bit deeper into the objects that, that are there, the objects are really depicting the treasuries of the European colonial world, its itineraries, and even the uh, fabric, the color that he's using, is telling about this. So it is an allegory not about just the local conditions of an artist in the Netherlands in the uh, 17th, 17th century, but it is as well an allegory of the global conditions of the world in uh, this. If you think about, on the other hand, for instance, an, a, 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 a picture like the uh, famous Courbet atelier, yeah? The, with the famous nude, but the famous nude is there just uh, uh, as allegory of the old arts and as an allegory of the outer world. But you, what you have, aside him on the right hand, you have uh, uh, that's what what made art, so to say, sovereign, namely the, the the thinking about being a sovereign discipline within bourgeois world. You see Proudhon, the famous philosopher. You see Baudelaire. You see. Uh, oh, but you see as well the mecen, the mecen, the one that paid him. On the other hand, you see the world coming in, the world of uh, uh, capitalism of, uh, of, of 19th century. You see the beggars, you see the poor people coming from the streets. That what Courbet and his realism wanted to depict another type of world, one could say, uh, that was transcending that, 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 that local. And uh, when you look at the picture that he's painting, you see the departure from the atelier to the plein air because of he's sitting in front of a landscape and he was one of the first ones that would go out. Bonjour, Monsieur Courbier, with his, uh, uh, with his, uh, uh, so, uh, and, uh, to the social and to paint. And if you think about the third, maybe, which is, uh, 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 which we consider uh, uh, maybe the most conservative one, if you think about Caspar David Friedrich sitting in his small atelier room just looking at uh, uh, the canvas and having the light 
coming in, so the 19th century idea of the artist as doing the chef, chef d'oeuvre, uh, you see what he suppresses as well, namely the murmurs of 48, that, that he was pressed to the privacy of the atelier, so to say, could not speak openly, could just produce in the atelier for a world outside that was dramatically changing. So even in the 19th century, this dialectics of the global and the local, or let's say the world, the outside, and uh, the cage of making was present in, uh, in, the, in, in, in a few of the most famous uh, examples of that, what one calls Western art history. Uh, I have the pleasure to talk about this subject from a more current perspective uh, with Boyana Page uh, sitting to my right, uh, a scene from you. Boyana Page was uh, born and educated in, El in Belgrade. She studied history and art at the Faculty of Philosophy at the Belgrade University. She was part of that, what one calls the new art practice in Yugoslavia, uh, uh, the arrival of neo-avant-garde post-studio performative uh, practices, practices that try to challenge the status of the art world in, uh, in, uh, in the 70s, actually late 60s, 70s, mainly from 72 on, and uh, in a strange studio situation as well, one could say, because of she was working then in the Belgrade uh, Students Cultural Center where uh, the uh, Titoist regime that was very much with modernism allowed you to perform something like a practice of a neo-avant-garde within the, within the uh, well, walls of the classical university system. Then Boyana <coughs> Uh, began uh, to write reviews in the 70s, 84 to 91. She worked as an editor uh, for the art history journal M Moment in Belgrade since 91. Uh, be uh, she has lived in Berlin and she has done uh, one of the seminal exhibitions uh, uh, after uh, 1989. Uh, 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 together with uh, David Elliott, she did she curated After the Wall, which was, so to say, the first discovery that something happened in the studios beyond the Iron Curtain that was valuable and not just valuable for the studios in the second, as you, as you call it, the second, uh, uh, the, the second, the second system. And uh, uh, most recently, uh, she has uh, uh, deepened that with the subject that she is really interested uh, in and has been practicing all this, namely, namely a feminist gaze on art history in a huge uh, and uh, as well seminal show on uh, called Gender Check on art and gender issues in Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Europe. Uh, cu currently, uh, Boyana is preparing a show for the MNAC in uh, Bucharest. Uh, to my left, it's B.C. Silver, who will talk about uh, probably uh, coming from, a, from a, 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 a context that is very current and uh, where, there are ve where there might be very uh, many debates about that, how an artist's practice could form it within such a context with the late arrival of something like the notion of contemporary art, with the colonial arrival of the notion of contemporary art, and with the decolonial attitude and uh, and and work of a lot of people that are trying, so to say, to uh, to, to to bring the methods uh, to the post and decolonial world uh, of nowadays. Beef is an independent curator uh, from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. She has been founding uh, director of the Center for Contemporary Art there, which opened in December 2007. She has participated in several international conferences and uh, symposiums and written essays for many publications as well as for international art magazines and journals such as Art Forum, M Metropolis M, Third Text, The Exhibitionist, well, uh, we'll come to that just in a minute. And on the, uh, she's on the editorial board of a feminist review as well, which is N Paradoxa, done by brave Katie Deepel in London. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in 2010, uh, she was the independent curator international, uh, 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 curator's international in inaugural touring curator. Her selected exhibitions are, um, 
moments uh, of beauty, GD Okai Oyekoji in uh, the Chiasma in Helsinki, uh, Praxis, Art in Times of Uncertainty at the Second Thessaloniki Biennial, and uh, 2006 she has co-curated the most important Western African uh, uh, art biennial uh, the long, with the longest history in Dakar Senegal. and Senegal. I come to, so to say, the, one of the centers of this panel because we just has published a book uh, uh, at MIT Press, which is not the worst uh, publisher to publish a book on, a subject that is currently debated uh, and the uh, book is just called The Studio. And it's uh, about, so to say, that what, uh, what the studio still remained after the heroic 60s uh, had proposed uh, uh, or, or, pro or, or announced a post-studio world art practice that was uh, uh, to be the future, which did not uh, turn out. So if you look around in the world, there is a lot of still studio practice going on. On the one hand, feeding the art markets with uh, almost uh, workshop-like conditions like in the Renaissance, on the others, a bit more like in the neoliberal, so to say, consumer economy that are, that are producing almost around consumer, consumer goods. On the other hand, uh, old type of uh, uh, deglobalized studios think about uh, uh, the, the big, big entities of IYY in China where you have a lot of students from over all the world uh, 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 figuring out this artist practice or uh, about our famous Icelandic colleague who is having a, a, a huge compound of that what one could call a studio. Uh, Jens uh, is uh, a very profiled uh, exhibition uh, curator and uh, not just in the world of visual, world, uh, visual arts but she, she has a long-term practice in theater and the performing arts as well. Uh, he is uh, uh, currently, his writing as well is currently based in San Francisco where he's the director of the CCA uh, what is Institute of Contemporary Arts? In 2011, he was the curator with Adriana Petroso, Petrosa of the 12th Istanbul Biennial, where they unveiled a lot of uh, political uh, engaged art practices uh, out of the studios somehow and out of the ateliers uh, and out of the archives of, of artists that have not been publicly visible because of the usual transport ways to the market or to the museums did not work in South America, maybe you'll come uh, to that a bit later. And he, is, he has founded uh, publishing uh, uh, initiatives as well, besides curating the Shanghai Biennale, Shanghai Biennale like uh, uh, a journal called The Exhibitionist, that is about reconsidering the history and the, the, cur uh, the, the current, so to say, agency of that, what we sometimes think about as an outworn format, namely the exhibition or the group exhibition. He uh, is assistant professor at the graduate program in curatorial praxis at the California Co College of Arts in San Francisco and guest professor at the Nova Academia de Bellas Artes in, uh, the, in Milan. And uh, we have an artist here who is, uh, so to say, uh, uh, Christoph, Christoph Draeger. He is a conceptual artist who lives in New York and Vienna, Traeger's uh, projects often take the form of installation, video, and photo-based media to explore issues pertaining to disaster and uh, uh, mediator-sated culture. His work has been exhib uh, exhibited worldwide in galleries and institutions. He is one of the prominent artists in the contemporary, in the critical, critical conceptual contemporary circle that is dealing with the world outside much more than with the uh, uh, goods uh, inside, so to say, the circulation of markets and uh, the value production of uh, visual arts that's going on as well. His uh, most recent solo exhibitions in 2012 has been Tsunami Architecture in cooperation with Heidron Holzfeind at OK, often as Kulturhaus in Linz, uh, he is, uh, f has a course at the Summer uh, Academy, had a course at the Summer Academy uh, this uh, year and that finished last uh, Friday. And uh, well, there is a list of exhibitions and international contributions. I, I, uh, I'd, I'd invite you to, 
go to uh, christophtrager.com to see more about uh, this practice and to hear Christoph now talking about what the studio meant to him and to a practice that is m uh, very much within the world and outside the studio. Christoph, thank you. We are looking forward to hearing you talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I was asked to start because I'm the artist on the panel and so to speak the lightweight. Um, preparing this presentation, I couldn't help but thinking of an anecdote I read a long time ago. An anthropological exhibition landed on an island somewhere in the Polynesian and encountered a tribe that was never before in touch with our civilization. The scientists were welcomed and allowed to stay. To stay. Slowly, they learned to communicate with the indigenous. One day, they asked the chief if he was interested to accompany them on a helicopter ride to explore the islands. The chief, after consultation with his tribes, who of course never had flown before, agreed at the condition that he was allowed to bring a few large stones with him. Surprised about the request, which they first deemed religious, the scientists soon found out that the purpose of the chief and the tribe was to fly the boulders to the other end of the island and drop them on the village of their enemies. Confronted with new possibilities that clearly enlarged their horizon, the people of the tribe immediately became creative and reinvented the bomb. So when I was asked to talk about the local global studio, I decided to um, talk about this topic in the most uh, direct, simple terms. Uh, so I will be focusing on the issue of traveling as an artist and moving my studio from one place to the other. After I finished art school in the small Swiss city of Luzern in 1990, there was the offer of a small postgraduate grant to go to a school abroad. I decided to try Brussels, mainly because I heard it was cheap, the language is French, which I speak, and it's in the middle of Europe. One of my young artist dreams was that this job would let me travel a lot. But obviously, first there was a need to produce something that could be shown before I could even dream of being invited to show abroad. By then, I was living with my small little grant in uh, Brussels, and I had a not so bad studio, very cheap. So I engaged in a rather quite intensive, if nonsensical, studio practice, which produ produced a lot of rubbish, probably like for a long, lot of young artists, the same situation, but also my first main idea, the construction of destruction. In a squatted factory, I engaged in the construction of two large-scale models. The size of each of one was about 100 square meters which I called catastrophe number one and catastrophe number two, which you can see here. That was catastrophe number one, which was modeled after a picture I saw in a magazine about Hurricane Andrew. The painstaking process took me almost two years to build them. By now, four years have passed since I arrived in Belgium, and after these constructions, I really felt I needed to get out of the studio, out of Brussels, but there was still no exhibition inside further away than maybe Mons, Antwerp, or Amsterdam. So I desperately tried to find a project of my own that would allow me to travel. This was catastrophe number two, took me even longer than catastrophe number one, and as a matter of fact, I wanted to do a whole series of catastrophes like this in my studio and photograph them afterwards as models. But after the second one, I was so tired of doing always the same that I decided it would become my final vision. My work soundly revolved around the idea of catastrophe by now. After some hard soul searching, I had an epiphany. I came up with the idea to visit and photograph, pl photograph places where a disaster had happened some time ago or even long ago, but where the destruction was usually not visible anymore and from where the international media attention had long faded. The only rule was that I had to, to be there myself and ideally take the photograph myself. So in my vision back then I saw like a sheep meadow with uh, a very idyllic landscape an image, and it says Lockerbie. Um, I later titled the project Voyage Apocalyptic. 
Happily, at that time, I won uh, quite an important grant from Switzerland for this piece, uh, Catastrophe Number no. 1, and uh, I, that allowed me to um, go for a trip for three months to the U.S., actually something that I dreamt of as a teenager, uh, to take a round trip of the United States, and I was able to photograph uh, 11 sites including the World Trade Center for the bombing that happened in 1993, where, where you can see here a little bit of the reconstruction of the hotel that was destroyed. Uh, Homestead after Hurricane Andrew, the picture that uh, inspired me for catastrophe number one. Um, Alamogordo, which was the place where the first atomic bomb was uh, blown up. And Mount St. Helens, uh, the one of the most uh, uh, massive volcanic explosions in recent uh, history. The next year, and this is uh, Three Mile Island, the site of the nuclear uh, disaster. The photographs were always presented like this. Uh, so the, the, the place was photographed, it looked like a normal place, but then the title was uh, underneath, like uh, it was on the photograph, so people could immediately have the superposition of uh, the landscape, which was harmless, and the place that was maybe known as a disaster place. The next year was 1995, and on August 6 and 9, it features the 50th anniversary of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By the way, the anniversary was yesterday again. Uh, August 6, uh, it's 67 years now. And since I was born on August 4, I had uh, maybe morally questionable idea to celebrate my 30th birthday in Hiroshima. But then the year 1995 became a year so densely packed with disasters and disaster memories in Japan, the Kobe earthquake in January, the serene gas attacks in February, the atomic bomb, uh, that I decided to also try to shoot a movie, which became an experimental documentary road movie titled Unganai, English Bad Luck. Um, we spent six weeks with a friend together. I, I also uh, worked back then. I worked very often in collabor collaborations, which I still do, actually. I like it very much, and also as a conceptual artist who doesn't really have skills, it's, it's very good to have a camera person who knows how to hold a camera and stuff, stuff like that. Um, at the same time, I added six more photographs to my photo voyage apocalyptic uh, series, uh, which this is a, a vol volcanic uh, eruption or a village after volcanic eruption. This is uh, Hiroshima, the day of my 30th birthday. And this is a town called Minamata, where this factory that is still very much visible here uh, poisoned the, the, the sea with mercury and over a, a thousand people uh, were uh, poisoned and many of them died. Now there's a museum and the water should be clean. Happily, the Voyage apocalyptic photos were quite well received, so I was invited to compete for the Swiss studio at PS1 International Studio Program in New York, which at that time was one of the best grants for Swiss artists. I put a lot of effort in, into my portfolio because I was the most unknown artist who was invited for this uh, prize, and luckily I was selected to move for a year to Manhattan with a studio at PS1 in Long Island City. Total euphoria. Shortly after arrival, I met another artist who also was on a grant from Austria, Hydron Holzfeind, and soon we planned our futures together. Both wanted to stay in New York forever, and after the year at PS1, we got a lease with a group of other artists and moved to a very big and very cheap warehouse in Bushwick, Brooklyn, in the heart of the East Williams, Williamsburg Industrial Park, which at that time was still a pretty wild area. We had bullet holes in the window and so on. And I think we were the only ones who got lucky enough to never get mocked in the area. This is the studio, which was in the only time in my life I, I really had a studio. And uh, the, the problem with the studio was that I was also living in the studio. So sometimes 
when you want to do dirty work and big sculptures, it's not so good if you have your bed right next to it. So it was limitations as well. My dearest wish as a young artist that my work would make me travel was more than fulfilled in the coming years. As a fact, when I counted the entry stamps for the US in my expired passport in 2007, I realized that I must have crossed the borders and therefore the Atlantic about 200 times. After the Japan trip, I mostly stopped planning trips for Voyage Apocalyptic. I would just photograph places whenever I was near one on one of my trips to exhibitions. I would plan our holidays, like the road trip to Nova Scotia one year after the crash of Swiss Air 111 in Peggy's Cove near Halifax. So I, I basically uh, invited uh, my girlfriend on a trip there and took this uh, picture. The only time I didn't have to travel at all when the catastrophe came right to my hometown was on September 11, of course, and I took my pictures, a picture the same day, just a few hours late, around five in the afternoon, but still much too late, considering that almost all the images we remember from that day were taken in the morning. I was so shocked that even though I that even though I was taking pictures, I didn't even think that these photographs could be part of the project. Early the next day, my gallery planned to send out the invitation card for my upcoming solo show in Brooklyn with the title, If You Lived Here, You Would Be Dead Now. And that was the image for the invitation card. Um, the show I did then open a few days later featured the same object, this uh, uh, trailer, this um, caravan in a burnt state and in the background you see this little um, music box that is also burned and actually I burned it on September 12 in the backyard and uh, while I was working on the object all of a sudden a, a beer bottle exploded about a foot from my head and, and I looked up and there was a guy leaning out the window of the same like warehouse where I lived and asked me are you a terrorist? Happily, he missed me, otherwise he would maybe have killed a terrorist. This was the interior of the trailer. Now fast forward to 2005, when after eight years we lost the lease of the loft to the real estate boom. At the same time, Hydron won a residency in Mexico City, and I already had another li one lined up for nine months in London in 2006. All of a sudden, it looked like we were joining the kind of artists who are moving from one residency to the next one. Anyway, we drove down to Mexico from New York in our old Volvo station wagon. The whole trip was a great adventure, and it allowed me to take more pictures for the project. This is Texas City, uh, the site of one of the biggest industrial disasters in the US. This uh, is Galveston natural disaster, and here we are in Mexico. Um, it was the first time that we started a project together. Since we were a couple and we were both artists, we, we said we might as well be able to uh, work together on something. And we, we did this, this project in Mexico City, um, which was basically tourism uh, as art. We were both interested in mod modernist architecture, more uh, her than me, but uh, we found this little, um, this little guidebook, pretty old guidebook about contemporary architecture. That's why the project is called Arquitectura Contemporanea. And we uh, decided to, um, to go to each place that was featured in the book and try to take the photograph uh, once again from the same angle. So here you see a building that now is covered completely with uh, advertisement. This building is still original, but the image had been flipped in the book. These are a few pages from a Mexican art magazine that uh, features. That's a museum uh, for Diego Rivera. And uh, the tree now just has grown a little bit out of portions. 
This building lost one floor in the earthquake uh, of 1985. And on this picture, you can see that there were three towers in 1968, and there's two towers missing now. And it's also due to the big earthquake of 1985. So even uh, when I do projects that seemingly have nothing to do with disaster, I, I find the disaster somewhere. After that, the residency in London uh, in turn turned out to be pretty dull, nine, nine months of bad weather and little inspiration. But at least uh, it allowed me to uh, meet two young curators who uh, invited me to yet another residency in uh, Birmingham. This one was only two weeks, but I... Um, I was able to, to do a, a little work there with the help of these people who were like working in my service as my assistant and, and organized everything, including uh, all the people that I needed for this little movie that I'm going to uh, show right now because it's short and I need a break. And it has some good music. Uh, so, this was uh, what I could do in two weeks with the help of a lot of people. It's, of course, a remake of a scene of uh, a famous film by uh, Ant Michelangelo Antonioni, Blow Up. And uh, at that time in my, uh, in my career, I was thinking a lot of the idea of the remake. And, uh, and I w at the same time, I was in London, and I went to a festival in Geneva where I met a curator from uh, Warsaw, and she uh, saw my films that I presented at that festival, and she asked me if I wanted to come to Warsaw to do a project there. And I uh, 
I said yes immediately because, of course, it's nice to be invited and stuff. And then she said, but I had to present the project. And, and then I was thinking about Poland, and I was thinking about the Holocaust, and I was thinking about the war, and I thought, well, this, I really don't want to do anything about the Holocaust and, and things. And, uh, and then once I, I was riding in a car, somebody, the, the speaker, announced that it was uh, soon to be the 40th anniversary of the Summer of Love in 2007, and I was invited for 2007, so I thought, that's it. I'm going to bring the Summer of Love to Warsaw because I thought they probably never had one since they were behind the Iron Curtain. Um, I had always been a complete fan of West Coast psychedelic music from the late 60s. I was a so-called deadhead, fan of the Grateful Dead at the age of 15. So the project I proposed for the castle was to start a hippie movement in those three months in the summer, and the result was called Hippie Movie. And Hydron was, of course, uh, with me again, and uh, as she was doing her own project about the modernist housing block, she was also the camera operator uh, for the hippie film, which um, I would love to show, but how am I doing with time? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, uh, maybe just a, a little bit uh, of the hippie movie. So just uh, skip through. Maybe just uh, the one time that what happened was that uh, I I started the club and uh, we had a great party in the club and uh, and and two days later the whole club burned because we booked put all these eggshells, uh, egg, egg card boxes around the walls and somebody uh, put a lamp too close. So even if I tried to do a, a hippie project, uh, it's kind of like bound to fail and the castle had to uh, close down for uh, two days and everybody got evacuated. And here's a little work by Lawrence Wiener. Far too many things to fit into a sm such a small box. Of course, also the motto of this uh, presentation. Um, there was another critical moment. There were a lot of nice moments, like our demonstration here at the military parade. 100,000 Poles who were cheering to their military and 10 people uh, of the hippie movement who were trying to protest for peace. We were singing John Lennon. We did a lot of like little hippie, hippiest stuff and, you know, like climbed, oh, this is nice, climbed like this. This is the monument for the World War II uh, pilots. Then this moment when my hippies became a little... So on and so on. It's generally a very cheerful work. And then I also wanted to um, have them swim in the river, just like Woodstock, you know.
Anyway, I was the only one going into that water, obviously. Then we had our little mini, mini Woodstock with five bands and it was, it was the summer of love. It was really nice. It was also an opportunity for me to uh, live something that I missed, obviously, because I'm, I'm too young uh, to have been participating to uh, 1967. I was only two years old. Um, so, from there we moved to Cairo, which was yet another residency, you see, um, where I didn't do much because I had to edit the hippie movie. Sometimes you get like too many residencies and then you're like basically, you fly from one place to the other and then you have to still work on the stuff that you did in the, at the other place. So I. Uh, I wasn't able to do, uh, I wasn't hardly ca capable to absorb much of the locality and transform it into a site-specific project. And uh, from there we went back to New York and uh, then our son was born and then we were thinking of like, what could we do? And then I came up with the idea of doing a project called Tsunami Architecture, which is basically um, a trip to the to all the places where the tsunami uh, happened. And I'm actually skipping through now. So this is still Mexico, and here is one of the places. It's, the, it's again one of those voyage apocalyptic uh, influence projects, but of course on a much larger scale because it was also a film and it was a commission by the Ocard Centrum. And we, uh, we flew the whole family, uh, including my little son now, we flew to uh, Thailand, Aceh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and India, and uh, uh, tried to find out how um, people were coping with the aftermath of the tsunami and what was uh, achieved with all this aid money, etc. And uh, that is, again, a film and, and a book that uh, we're preparing. I see uh, the time is running out. Since Georg is sitting here, tap, tap, tap. But here is a dummy of the, the book. And then you see some, some places we, we visited. This is some like uh, immediate disaster relief uh, shelters. This is another picture for Voyage Apocalyptic. And this is a, a film set that we found uh, on our research. We, like somebody told us, you have to go there. This hotel looks really interesting for you. It looks like the tsunami happened yesterday. And we went there. And of course, people were building a film set for a Hollywood movie that dealt with uh, the tsunami. So I think I leave it at that. Um, and give to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to Salzburg, to bring me all the way from San Francisco um, to, to Austria, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I actually hope to escape the hippies in San Francisco, um, being on the plane for the last 12 hours and um, 8,000 miles away, but Christoph reminded me, hippies are everywhere. Um, kind of looked a bit like a scene that I could see in San Francisco um, on a weekend in Golden Gate Park. Um, so it was pretty accurate. Um, as um, Georg already mentioned, I recently published a book called uh, the, the Studio. Actually, I, my idea was to call it the Artist Studio, but the publisher insisted it should just be the studio. Um, and, and one of the things that perhaps would be interesting for us to discuss today, uh, also maybe later in the panel discussion, is really like why is there such an interest in the subject of the studio? Um, at the moment, I'm sure that, that's, that there are several different um, reasons for that, but um, it is interesting that it took 
um, the art community such a long time to actually sort of start focusing more on examining the studio after, of course, um, it had already investigated and scrutinized um, with you know, quite critical attention. Um, the, the commercial gallery, the art school, um, and the museum. Um, so my idea with the book was to bring the subject to a larger audience, and um, the book consists mainly of, uh, of uh, historical and perhaps also some recent texts, essays and interviews, as well as quotes and some paragraphs um, that um, compile the book, which is um, organized in, in a number of different chapters. Um, so the, the goal was really sort of to, to examine what is the role and what is the function of uh, the studio in contemporary artistic practice and contemporary society and what is the relationship between art that is produced today and, and, um, and the studio. Um, and perhaps later at the end of my presentation I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what Georg mentioned also in the beginning already, uh, some of the perhaps more um, problematic um, reasons behind the, the focus on the, on the studio. So traditionally, of course, the, uh, the studio has been considered uh, the place where artists make work. Um, and um, in a more traditional understanding, of course, uh, we always think about uh, this you know, beautiful romantic image of the painter somewhere under the attic or, or you know, having, making sculptures uh, there. And um, you know, usually that imagination or that idea takes place in Soho or it's in, in, in Paris somewhere and there's lots of paint on the ground and um, usually there's a lot of paint also um, on the, the artist's uh, wardrobe. And another sort of stereotypical idea of the artist studio, of course, is the studio of, of the uh, grand um, Dutch and Flemish masters. If you think about Van Meer, Van Eyck, Rubens, um, that are full of assistants, they're almost factory-like, and um, often also incorporate um, many um, aristocratic um, clients. Um, or we think of uh, the studio as a space full with eccentric characters, a mixture of uh, advertisement agency, film studio, nightclub, um, of course, as in the famous example of Andy Warhol's factory. A lot of the idea of the uh, sort of romantic notion, um, of course, comes also from the artists themselves. Um, when you think about uh, Jackson Pollock, for example, and uh, the famous photographs uh, by Hans Namut that depict him in his uh, studio, it's actually also a film. Um, here's some examples of, of work by the uh, Dutch and Flemish masters that I mentioned. And here, three images of uh, Warhol's factory that became not only this very secluded space for sort of a singular mind, but really a, a, a social space, and, and indeed a factory where art was not only made, but manufactured. Um, so it's fair to say that um, the studio in many ways is the birth day, uh, birthplace of art, but it would be wrong to believe that this is the only function. Um, to be the site for creation of artworks. Nor is the studio today the only place where art can be made, as we just saw in Christoph's uh, presentation. So with the shifts and changes in artistic production over the last century, the death of the studio has been proclaimed at numerous times, especially during the heyday of conceptual art in the 1960s and 70s, when the concept of art as idea penetrated more traditional artistic production, suggesting a move away from the hand of the artist and the physical creative act, and perhaps any consideration of skill at all. And um, I'm sure that in the context of um, the Salzburg Academy this year and the issue of the subject of the studio, John Balassari's uh, very famous boss studio class at uh, CalArts has um, already been uh, discussed. So the moment when the grip of traditional media such as painting and sculpture weakened, the studio in a classic sense, began to disappear. And while many artists indeed do not have typical studios anymore, most do maintain some kind of working space. Most uh, maintain some kind of working space. Instead of talking about the end of the studio, then perhaps we can speak about the expanded concept of the studio, even if that is only a laptop computer on the artist's kitchen table. I decided to um, call the introductory essay 
um, to the book, the studio, uh, the studio in the expanded field, going back to Rosalind Krauss's essay of sculpture in the expanded field. And not that I claim any similar relevance in terms of the examination of this specific topic within art history. Um, I um, related the investigation of my book um, to her expansion of the idea of sculpture, particularly in the moment when she starts to investigate minimal and post-minimal art. So some artist, um, some artist studios have expanded to house a number of functions that were previously, previously associated with the outside world. And I think this is a, a, a big shift in, in the function and, and um, the understanding of uh, the studio. And I already spoke a little bit about uh, Warhol's factory. So the, the studio becomes um, a social and professional space where artists begin to meet with curators. They also meet with other artists. They meet with you know, collaborators. Um, they meet with gallerists and dealers to present them the latest work that is going to be in the gallery exhibition. And of course, more and more artists meet directly with collectors in their studios. During these studio visits by dealers, curators, or, or um, collectors, the outsiders see new artwork, talk about upcoming exhibitions, and conduct business. And following an increased professionalization of the art world, it is not unusual for the artists' assistants to busy themselves not only with more traditional labor of producing work, but following, following the artist's instructions, but also with operational matters, such as organizing travel and business scheduling for the artist, organizing production, that in, often, in many cases um, is now outsourced to specialists, and um, administrating loan requests and shipping. Um, and Georg was also already mentioning the example of very successful artists like Olafur Eliasson, who have uh, staff that um, is numbering in the dozens, and he's not the only example. Artists throughout history have conceived of the role and the function of the studio in various ways. Many have used it as a starting point and subject for their own work. And some early and well-known paintings in this category of looking at the studio um, uh, Rembrandt von Rhein's Artist in His Studio, which you see here, as well as Gustav Courbet's The Artist Studio, 1955. In the former, the viewers allowed a glimpse into the studio in the moment the artist steps back from his finished canvas to contemplate the result of his labor. He has moved into the background and is barely visible, giving the artwork center stage. But interestingly, we cannot see what he has made only a glow emanating um, from its surface. Courbet's scene could not be more different. In the center, we see the artist himself painting a landscape surrounded by the main influences of his life. The canvas is filled with characters, real life acquaintances, acquaintances friends, as well as fictional figures. Whether these two works, and there are several others, uh, from this period demonstrate a newfound form of self-reflexivity or simply a glorification of the figure of the artist. They certainly mark a shift in the artist's understanding of the creative act as well as the role and function of the studio. My own curiosity about this particular subject came about because of another rather recent tendency in the art world, which to me, when I discovered it, was rather odd the representation and display of complete artist studios inside of museums. The for most famous one probably is the Atelier of Constantin Bacuzzi that you see here opposite the Centre Pompidou in Paris. But the Francis Bacon studio at the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin, brought to uh, Dublin from its original location um, in South Kensington in London, and the workspaces of Eduardo Palozzi exhibited at the National Galleries in Scotland, which you see here in Edinburgh, were the two primary encounters that prompted me to think more about what actually happens when the studio of the artist is presented as a work of art in an institutional context. The question led me to organize an exhibition at the Hugh Lane Gallery, the home of the Francis Bacon Studio, which I co-curated with Queen Christina Kennedy, the director of exhibitions at the Hugh Lane, in which we presented the work of more than 20 artists alongside the Bacon Studio. This exhibition was organized in 2006. The works in this exhibition address the studio as a subject. 
here you see a, a view of a, a work by John Ball, um, um, Daniel Buren, excuse me, and, and Francis Stark in um, relationship to the other. Of course, Daniel Buren um, wrote a, um, a very um, important and seminal essay um, on the function of the studio um, and a whole series of works that came out of that particular um, text were created by Francis Stark that we um, installed right behind the facade um, that um, Buren created here with uh, the foil on the facade of the, of the museum. Um, we exhibited uh, the Spider-Man studio by Martin Kippenberger. It's just a few examples here. A series of um, photographs by Wolfgang Tillmans depicting his studio in which he often photographs the morning after a party took place in his uh, studio um, with this foil, of course, also um, a bit reminiscent of, of uh, Warhol's factory. Um, Tillmans also started a gallery um, below his studio um, in, a, in an unused space. Uh, this is, was Fisher's studio, Fisher's studio from um, his residency in London, um, where we took the complete studio that Urs Fisher had in, um, at Gasworks and brought it over to, uh, to Dublin. Um, we showed Paul McCarthy's uh, The Painter, a quite hilarious um, video in which a uh, dealer and the collector are actually coming to visit the artists and to uh, view uh, new work and again get involved in uh, um, sort of uh, an outburst of hysteria coming from, from the painter itself, uh, which ends in everybody being covered in um, ketchup and mayonnaise. Um, a series of works also by Bruce Nauman. He is a, a famous photograph falling to levitate in the studio, but we also presented um, his famous work um, where he is um, with a surveillance camera taping um, the, his studio in, in New Mexico. Works from um, installed as in the studio of Eva Hesse, so kind of remake of Eva Hesse's studio. Um, works by Francesca Woodman and Cindy Sherman that sort of like reveal the making of these works and the apparatus behind it. For example, these uh, photographs that were um, done of Cindy Sherman taking photographs of herself by uh, the American Vogue. Of course, Gerhard Richter's Atlas, a collection of images um, that Richter had in his studio um, to supposedly give him inspiration for um, the work he was uh, doing. Martha Rosler's library. Um, he actually exhibited her Martha Rosler's office with only a part of the library. This is the, the full library here in Antwerp. Uh, in the picture, Martha Rosler herself, together with uh, Dieter Rolstrater. Um, of course, Edward Kaczynski's studio couldn't be missed in this um, overview. Um, the, the studio on the street. Um, we presented a, a number of street artists, uh, most famously, of course, Jean-Michel Basquiat um, in a film by Glenn O'Brien. And then um, this uh, series of light boxes, uh, the gifted amateur who uh, creates his studio in his living room, um, sort of remaking uh, Morris Lewis paintings uh, here. Um, I think there's quite a lot of interesting um, questions been raised before, especially in, in Georg's um, introduction. And, and one of the ideas, or one of the things that, 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 that he said that made me think was really like, why is there an attention on the studio? As, as in, many, in many cases in the art world, a lot of things move with trends, and it might just be that this whole thing just now came up and um, people are just jumping on the bandwagon. But at the same time, there could of course also be other reasons behind it. And one of the things is of course that we need to somehow, and maybe it's not us, but maybe it's the world of museums, of galleries, and of course of art schools, keep a romantic notion of the artist alive in order to uh, you know, create a larger market for it or also a larger public awareness. Um, maybe it stands also in relationship to finding sponsors and doing fundraising. Um, MFA programs in the United States with their hundreds of studios in schools, for example, uh, clearly benefit from this very romantic notion of, of the artist. But I think also um, our understanding of art um, and how museums present themselves at this point is very strongly related to this uh, sort of artistic genius. And, and it's very difficult to uh, 
um, overcome this. And the more I'm thinking about um, uh, uh, this book, the more I, I, I come to the conclusion that there is also something quite um, regressive or even um, reactionary about holding on to this particular notion of the artist studio. Um, or at least not allowing for it to, to expand and introducing a larger audience to it. Um, a couple of months ago, I saw a film, and Maria Lynn is going to help me with this one. It was a film about the future of the Moderna Musette by uh, Marisha Lewandowska. Lewandowska. Yes. And she was not only talking about like, the future of the art world or the future of, of the museums, but she was also talking about um, how galleries, commercial galleries, would in themselves have art schools attached to them. So it wouldn't be necessary for the scouts of the galleries to go to all the MFA programs in the United States anymore, but to actually just you know, go next door and see what the students are doing, um, raise them, foster them, and actually really create niches and markets for them the same way they are doing this in the music or film industry. So perhaps uh, when we have our conversation later on, um, we can go back to uh, some of those questions. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by saying um, thank you to um, Summer Academy for inviting me on this panel and making my stay in Salzburg stimulating, as I also have the opportunity to take part in the curatorial workshop led by Maria Lind and Juan Gitan. When invited to be part of this panel, I felt challenged by the subject matter, but accepted because it would force me to think about a subject area that has received little or no public platform or discourse. Whilst I had access to considerable information on the critical trajectory of studio practice in the West, I could find no information about Nigeria and just one or two from South Africa. This is interesting because considering every artist talks about going to or being in their studio and calls him or herself a full-time studio artist, what then can that mean within a Nigerian and African context? Consequently, my presentation is tentative and essentially a work in progress. It is more of a presentation of my initial findings that hopefully, as more information and research is undertaken, can permit a more critical postulation on studio practice and begin to articulate the idea of the studio from a Lagos-Nigerian perspective specifically. I say specifically because in many other African countries, art education at university levels are inadequate. And, like else, and I know that like elsewhere, there will be similarities, um, inevitably local, due to local and historical parameters being taken into consideration. I will start by providing an overview of the cultural context in Lagos as a way of understanding the conditions and situations which impact on artistic practice in Nigeria. While studio visits form an integral component of my work, I was actually keen to engage Nigerian artists and look at it from their perspective. So in pursuing research for this presentation, I sent out a few general questions to several artists about their studio practice, and I have excerpted some of these responses and will reference them as the presentation unfolds. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa with an estimated population of over 140 million people. And Lagos, the former seat of government, but now the commercial and cultural capital, is in the list of the top 10 megacities as it approaches 18 million people. In spite of infrastructural challenges over the past, in spite of um, past infra infrastructural challenges over the past decade, important and exciting advances have been made in the cultural sector. Nollywood, which is the Nigerian film industry, is developing at a phenomenal pace to its current position as the second largest film industry in terms of output after Bollywood and before Hollywood. 
Nigerian literature has always enjoyed international visibility through the works of Nobel Prize winner um, Wole Shoinka and writers such as Chinua Achebe. However, there's a new generation of writers with the most visible being Chinamanda Adichie. Over the past five years, Nigerian fashion designers, Nigerian fashion, where am I? Sorry. Nigerian fashion designers are redefining the parameters of African design and are now presenting their works in New York, Paris, and Johannesburg. These developments are visible. These developments are visible in the field of music, comedy, and in the performing arts. And within this context, the visual arts sector is beginning to reorganize, restructure, and take its place within the cultural community. Though still relatively small, the art market is nonetheless the biggest in West Africa and among the top ones across the continent. There is a growing but mainly private visual arts infrastructure consisting of commercial art galleries, art auctions, this is in Nigeria, of at least four auctions a year, a growing collector base of middle-class Nigerians, foreign diplomats working in the hospitality, banking, telecommunications, and very lucrative oil industry. There are over 25 fine art departments at university level granting BFAs and a smaller number granting MFAs. Art history is integrated into the fine art department as a compulsory module, but there are no standalone art history departments. There exists little or no government involvement or interest in the arts at local, state, or federal level. Therefore, all art initiatives are the results of individual and private efforts. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, well, I'm gonna start about talking, I'm gonna start with modern art in Nigeria at the beginning of the 20th century, which of course is when studio practice was introduced um, into the Nigerian context. And the starting point for that is with the artist called Aino Onobolu, um, who has been credited with the introduction of a Western form of art into Nigeria. He started painting at the age of 12, um, at the end of the 19th century, using illustrated magazines and missionary religious texts as sources of inspiration. After his education in Lagos, he started working as a clerk, but still harbored his passion for art, teaching himself to paint in the European academic style. Deeply influenced by missionary teaching, he rejected African traditional art. In fact, one of the letters that he received by a British railway worker, Mr. J. Holloway, in 1910 says, I'm happy that you yourself realize the danger of going your forefather's way by creating the type of art that our church can quarrel with. Whilst in his loyalty to Christianity, Onabolu developed content for African art, he wanted to perfect his realist depictions, whilst his contemporaries, such as Picasso, were being influenced by art. In 1907, he completed his first oil painting of Lagos socialite, Mrs. Savage. I don't have a picture of that, but this is um, a picture that he painted. I didn't get the date, I got it off the internet because there's very little um, images um, available, but this was painted, I think, around the 50s, 1950s, of a Nigerian chief. I know Onobulu may not have been the greatest artist, but he worked tirelessly to convince the British to introduce art education into the school system. He lived quite comfortably as a portrait artist, undertaking commissions for many elite Lagosians. His efforts would benefit the next generation of artists, such as Benemumu. Benemumu has been called the first quintessential modern African artist. He benefited from art education very early on in Nigeria and also went to school abroad. He went to the UK where he studied at the Slade School of Fine Art. In the seminal publication on Ben and Wumu, 
by the art historian, Prof um, Professor Silvestro Ogwechi, called The Making of an African Modernist. Ogwechi presents a fascinating and scholarly analysis of the pictures of the artist in his studio as the starting point for his study. He describes how Mwumwu challenged attempts by European critics to distort the nature of his contemporary practice as an African modernist or to frame his work within a primitivist paradigm. Through the studios, um, Mwumwu used the studio and also sartorial detail um, to actually project himself as a modern artist, um, working in the late 40s and 50s in the UK and returning to Nigeria in the early 50s. So these two images, um, sorry, here, this is a picture of the, the artist in his studio in London in 1947 and this one in 1959. And Mogo was very um, particular about the way in which um, he was depicted um, as an artist. He wanted to move away from any kind of links to a, a tribal, um, primitive form of art making and really engage with you know, a modern form whilst also still dealing with subject matters that had to do with um, his Nigerian reality. He's also one of the first African artist to be commissioned um, to do a sculpture of um, Queen Elizabeth, which was unveiled in 1957 in an exhibition at the Royal Society of British Artists. So I'm just going to go through a couple of artists moving you know, fairly quickly um, through them. Sorry about that. I'm just putting this down because I'm going to show a video. He's a professor of sculpture at the University of Nigeria, Unsuka, in the eastern part of Nigeria, where he also has his studio. Elanachu is known for his monumental sculptural installations made of metal bottle caps. He has received wide critical acclaim and has shown in most of the most important exhibitions and museums around the world. He's the first artist of African origin to be collected by the Metropolitan Museum and his works can be found in numerous public and private collections around the world. I'm going to show a little, a short. The studio is located in the university of Kazuka. In southeastern Nigeria. It's uh, about 10, 20 minutes by walking north of the university campus. A lot of times that I come in unexpectedly, and I'll find my car elsewhere and I'm walking, and uh, you hear a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, how do you call it, uh, manta. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very long one time. When I go in that day, I want to quiet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I always demand that there is that we are absolute silence in the world, as much silence as possible. You are that impressed of myself that the studio is a, a sacred place that you can do, do some bit of reflection and thinking. Maybe 
story with famous music and then start playing around with them. And then that when you now have to lay all of them out, scatter them in the studio and then start picking uh, what you need for each portion of the world. They put them together in a bunch and we try to see what we can suggest. Something that you feel is interesting or something impressive, then you have started a new idea. You just play around, play around, shift around, and at times for days you can just keep shifting things around and taking photographs of them and putting them on the computer. And uh, so I have a lot of images on my computer. In course of time, I can go back and just keep looking at this. You need to have a large bank of images, of effects, of textures, you know, that I can always refer to, and they could trigger off new ideas. Because ideas do come at very unusual times. So as you can see, the idea of the traditional studio is well and alive um, still um, in Nigeria. I'm just going to flick through a few images that have been sent by a younger generation um, of artists um, who I sent some questions to, but also sent me some images um, of their practice. This is um, Victor Ehikameno in his outdoor studios. A lot of um, artists in Nigeria have their studios in their house, um, in a yard that's attached to the house. Um, those who um, are in flats um, have a room that's usually used as a studio space. Um, Victor is an artist um, that works, he's a painter, he's a photographer in a diversity um, um, of media. He works in a diversity of media. And um, this is his studio's place where he prepares the work, but also it's a social space where friends sometimes, you know, come and visit him. And as he um, continues with his work, he's also engaging them, um, um, his friends and um, visitors. And, you know, Victor has said, I asked him that, um, Victor says there's a lot that happens in an artist studio space that cannot be transported to a gallery, museum. When I asked him about the importance of um, studio visits, um, he says there's a lot that, that, that can happen in an artist studio space that cannot be transported to a gallery, museum, or another space. Because studio visits can lead to a career change, I place a lot of emphasis on them. And whenever I can, I do try and um, invite critics and curators um, to visit my space. This is um, the studio of um, Rom Isishi, who is a painter um, in Nigeria. He works essentially in oils, but also adds um, other materials um, um, into his paintings. Um, and I, he's more of a commercial painter, a very traditional painter, even though he's fairly young, probably in his um, mid-40s um, at the moment. Well, yeah, in his mid-40s. Um, here we have um, Kweju Laiwala, who is a lecturer at one of the art schools, um, an art historian, uh, a mother. And, you know, I asked her about how she sort of deals, you know, what her studio is like. She was preparing um, a major exhibition um, in 20, this was last year, and I wanted to have an idea um, of how she actually, you know, works and prepares um, the, the, the exhibition. She says she works in different, you know, she has also, as you can see, there's a, 
on this side. It's a sort of like garage that's attached to the house. So she works there when she has visitors. She moves inside. She has young children, so she has to work, you know, um, her studio has to be close um, to um, her house. Um, and she also allows her student, um, young artists who can't afford to have their own, stud um, their own studios, to come and work um, um, in her studio. So this is an exhibition that she prepared that deals with the um, British punitive ex um, expedition in Nigeria in 1897 when they went into Benin and ransacked the kingdom and the palace of the king and took away um, all the art objects, most of which can be found or seen at the um, British Museum in London. Um, Beju is actually um, from the Benin royal family. Her mother was one of the first women artists um, in the Benin kingdom, and um, the king that was taken off the throne is actually her great grandfather. So she wanted to engage with this um, history which had been written about from an outside of Nigeria but had never been dealt with you know, from inside of Nigeria. This is Emeka Ogbo, who is a young um, artist um, working in sound and um, video, um, and video. And um, this is his flat. He has um, a room in his flat, which um, he uses um, for his work. Um, a lot of his work um, in, involves capturing the sounds of Lagos. He's, he uses um, the sounds of Lagos to actually document um, a city in, in transition. And whilst a lot of the work is done outside, the final editing, of course, is done um, within um, his, his studio. Um, he says about his studio, the studio has significantly and positively impacted on my art by providing me an enabling environment to create and experiment more. I have seen my installations become stronger and more fine-tuned due to the possibility to try out different audiovisual experiments since setting up a studio. I've also added um, two Nigerian artists based in the diaspora. Um, Uche Okwa Eroha is a photographer who is um, currently at the Ritz Academy in um, Amsterdam. And I think, you know, for me, it's interesting to see the way that, you know, having the space um, to um, actually experiment, which sometimes a lot of um, artists in Lagos, you know, they're, they're hampered by having that space. Um, if you're a photographer, then your work um, resides um, in, on your laptop. And, you know, it's sometimes too expensive to print it out. You don't have the possibility to experiment with different materials in printing out your images. So I think that, you know, having a studio um, space um, where he can focus um, fully on his work, you know, has, you know it shows the, the diversity of work that he's now doing. And, of course, you know, it's also a social space where he has his, his um, young family um, with him. And um, the final image I want to show is of another Nigerian artist who is um, based in um, Canada. And this is, um, you know, her studio while she was preparing for uh, a, an, an exhibition, I think, which opened just recently in the last um, day, week or so. Um, she says, you know, about, I just want to read a little bit, you know, what she wrote when I sort of told her to describe a little bit, um, you know, her studio practice here. She says, my day at work starts quite early. The ends of the plastic bags are stripped off and the bags are, I'm talking about her process, are stripped off and the bags are cut into loops of varying sizes. I meticulously collect the straps of plastic bags and store them in containers for future use on other projects. They cannot be discarded. This is the start of the preparatory stages of my artwork. The activity of preparing the bags is quite repetitive, boring and tedious. I spend weeks getting thousands of bags ready for braiding. My aim is to make the braiding process as seamless as possible with as few interruptions as possible. I work in silence many times 
and this amplifies the sounds that come from the bags and the activities I'm engaged with. The rustling has become usual and soothing, almost like the whisperings of a crowd or informal communication between friends. Once the bags are cut, they're opened up and hung on easels, on easels turned stands like spun wool. I then begin to braid. The sound of the bags rustling as I weave creates a rhythm. And as that happens, I get, she says, I get teleported, figurative, from the immediate space where I stand in my studio into a state of peaceful calmness. Although I do this act of braiding in solitude, braiding is in contemporary Nigeria is a communal activity. But in some strange way, in my solitude, with the whisper, like rustlings of bags and the rhythm of activities, I feel an immediate belonging as if to a communal whole. My space becomes intimate and almost tangibly linked with memories of my former spaces. This meditative state is short-lived as the last bag strip is used and the rigorous process of preparing the bags for braiding commences again. The cycle goes on and on for weeks and months, every strand reflecting my mood during the braiding. So to conclude, why hasn't there been any attention to this area of practice within Nigeria? Given that by and large, our conception of the studio is predicated on its historical development and theorization within the context of the West, it is all the more urgent that we begin to develop a model for conceptualizing the studio within the locally specific frame of Nigeria. In other words, is there anything inherently Nigerian about the studio beyond geography? To be sure, I'm not simply after an essentialist definition of the studio vis-a-vis -vis Nigeria, but rather, I'm hoping that an emphasis on the, on the site of production might enable a more discursive way of thinking about not only what the studio is and what it can be, but also what can be learned from a work of art as a product of decisions that occur in the artist's studio. Thank you. Hello. Uh, like everybody else today, I am really grateful that I was invited by Summer Academy. Although when I got the invitation, I really didn't understand why I was invited because I never, since the 70s, when I think studio is over, I never thought about the studio. But I try to best out to make best out of it. And to propose, since we still are fighting with definition what the studio is, I propose a little detour. And what I will try to tell you today, I will try more or less to, to deal with the nation state as studio. I mean, also artist studio. Uh, the, since I was, as Georg said, I was uh, last 20 years uh, uh, rather East-centric, Ossi-Fach-Idiotin. I was busy with, with Eastern Europe with, with reasons, but uh, I started to be obsessed with nationalism and with monuments since the beginning of Yugoslav Wars from 91 and 99. And uh, during this uh, period, uh, it was very important, and still now, and it is almost forgotten, what happened with women in this war, or what happened with women after the fall of uh, state socialism as, uh, as a state system. Uh, the, my paper relates to two notions. Historians try to convince us, at least for historian, memory matters. And uh, I will squeeze my presentation today between these memory matters of historians and the body matters issue, which are in focus of, uh, still are in focus of feminist thinking. Uh, the term that is uh, new for me, uh, was new for me, is this notion of mnemosphere, sphere of memory. 
which was used by uh, Minea Mirkan, uh, Romanian curator, who used this term dealing with the artworks uh, made by artists who deal with collective memory. So now I, uh, sorry, I begin my official presentation. This was only introduction. And I start with this sentence. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of memory. This statement may sound awkward these days for at least two reasons. Firstly, in our neoliberal post-Utopian universe, universe, any leftist think, thinking and action are exposed to amnesia. And secondly, because the last sentence of the Communist Manifesto to which I, which I rephrased sounds today terribly Eurocentric. Well, in truth, a drift of memorialism is not only haunting Europe, but the entire world, entire globe. Theoreticians of all kinds say that we are actually experiencing a memorial term, and for some time now, let's say over 30 years, the world's nations, ethnic communities, minority groups, and common individuals are, as well as professional artists, have been willingly performing their devoir de mémoire, duty to remember. Ten years ago, uh, that is 2002, French art historian Pierre Nora observed, I quote, we are witnessing a worldwide, a worldwide upsurge in memory. Over the last 20 or 25 years, every country, every social, uh, ethnic or family group has undergone a profound change in the relation it traditionally enjoyed with the past. And he believes that this worldwide, worldwide trend brought about an inception of what he calls minority memories, which destabilized and criticized institu institutionalized views of the past. In his view, uh, this memorial turn is conditioned by three types of decolonization. First is international decolonization, which enabled earlier colonized society to embark on the rehabilitation or fabrication of their memories. Second type is domestic decolonization within traditional Western societies of sexual, social, religious, and provincial minorities. And finally, an ideological decolonization after the collapse of totalitarian regimes, whether communist, Nazi, or just plain totalitarian, as occurred after 1989 in Russia, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Latin America, and Africa. His, he, Nora writes, again quote, the explosion of minority memories of this kind has profoundly altered the respective status and the reciprocal, reciprocal sorry, nature of history and memory, or to be more precise, had enhanced the very notion of collective memory, hitherto little use, used. The existence of what he called of minority memories bring us closer to the practices of public art. These practices are perform performed in a democratic public sphere, which is neither a monolith nor a unified space, as Jürgen Habermas tried to convince us in, in the 60s, but public space, public space is instead fragmented into many, sometimes confl conflicting spheres, each having or cherishing its own memories. This is a field which, as I mentioned, uh, Minea Mirkan or Mirchan called mnemosphere. Uh, now, let's just jump back to the 80s, when the memorial turn has taken ma a vari various manifestations, commemorative events and the building of new historical museum, demands for signs of the past that had been previously repressed, a growing interest in roots, uh, with an attachment to patrimoine in France or heritage in England. In the 90s, when the communist, uh, post-communist Europe saw birth or rebirth of the independent nation states, 
This part of the world had the, of the world experience the post-communist iconoclasm nicknamed the age of Lenin in, in ruins. The communist monuments were dismantled, the monuments of earlier periods pointing to the national history were rebuilt. This was the period, a period in history which just confirms an old sculptor's wisdom, which reads, a monument that was not erected at least twice did not deserve to be built in the first place. The monument as practice, as a concept, lived a renaissance in the 90s when uh, it was discovered as a semiotic joker, as one uh, German historian said. Among var various technologies of memory at our disposal, monuments and memorials are those, as one artist put it, impossible necessities, which by fixing, the pa uh, fixing past historical events, perform a remaking of the past. Not any past, however, but our past, our memory, which is considered to be constitutive of our identity. However, a historian John uh, Gillis draws here an important intention, uh, important comment, which uh, fundamentalist nationalists would never accept. I take example of my fundamentalist Serbs. Uh, Gillis says, I quote, we need to be reminded that memories and identities are not fixed things, but representation or constructions of reality subjective rather than objective phenomena. Memories help us make sense of the world we live in, and memory work is, like any other kind of physical labor, embedded in complex uh, class, gender, and power relations that, that, are, that determine what is remembered or forgotten, by whom and for what end. The works I will show today refer or deal with a certain collective memory or personal memory, but they remind us that memory labor uh, implies both remembering and forgetting, memory and amnesia. And the works I'm going to show you today, there are seven pieces. Uh, I have selected them because they deal with something which is with uh, historical events or processes which are exposed generally to public amnesia. But by setting these problems in the, public, in the public sphere, like in exhibitions or in, in, in the street, if you wish, those artists, in my view, perform a political uh, memorial and political job. Uh, first of all, uh, work by Italian artist Cristiano Berti, uh, memorial. Mainly landscapes. couple of industrial sites. What lies, uh, because, uh, bes I have selected some, but this series consists of 18 images. And what is behind this beautiful les uh, landscape is the following. This is artist Bateman. 18 women were killed between 93 and 2001 while working as sex workers on the streets of the province of Turin, Torino. Memorial shows the 18 places in which the corpses of these women were found. Uh, artists established, uh, reconstructed the place of the murder after doing two year research, uh, researching local newspapers, the places, places were often, uh, the places were often identified uh, thanks to the help of the people who had the precise knowledge of the place in which the body of it was found and so on, meaning these murders are never uh, resolved by uh, Italian police uh, who could not or didn't care too much to find the murderer of these women. 
This is already with this theme, be, uh, with this theme of women trafficking and prostitution of women from Eastern Europe coming to the, to, to the West, who were forced or by their own, uh, own decision, uh, is a theme that is not uh, in, in the it is not uh, in, 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 the public, in the public sphere. I don't want to accuse Italy as a national state because Italian police didn't, didn't find the murderers, uh, or to claim that all prostitutes in Italy are uh, Eastern European because he also, it would be interesting for you, he also made two series with Nigerian prostitutes who also work, uh, worked in, in Torino. Uh, these events, are conditioned by post-communist condition and without post-communist condition and the end of the, of the uh, Cold War, we wouldn't have today globalization. Now we come back to my favorite topic, uh, nation, of, uh, nation, nation. Ilona Nemet installation, by the way, I found it in Springerin, uh, a mirror. Uh, uh, Ilona Nemet is uh, originally Hungarian but lives in Slovakia. And in this is a nation made in, in Hungarian time, Giora, I don't know how to pronounce it. She placed a huge monument in front of the, of the, he posed the, in front of the monument which features the mythic Hungarian bird. I don't even know how to, to pronounce it, named Taral bird which occupies central place in Hungarian national imagination because it, is, it refers to uh, great Hungary when Hungary was uh, big and powerful. Uh, and this bird is placed on, the, on, on many, many monuments. And this brings us to the uh, question of nationalism. As you know, uh, Benedict Anderson defines nation as a community I quote, conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. Ultimately, it is this fraternity that makes it possible over the past two centuries for so many millions of people not so much to kill as willingly to die for such limited imaginings of, of their own nation. And here one point by, by one fantastic text written in 1882, but French uh, historian and theoretician Ernst, Ernst Renan, Renan, who wrote the text, Qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une nation? What is a nation? And he here claims, and this is central to any nationalism, this is victimhood. Yeah, we are all victims of some other forces. And Renan, uh, Renan uh, crucial remarks uh, uh, are crucial because he claims that nations feel united, not so much by their glorious heritage, uh, shared joys and hopes for the future, but rather, I quote, by having suffered together, and indeed, suffering in common unifies more than joy does. Where national memories are concerned, defeats are of more value than triumphs, they impose duties and re uh, require a common effort. Good. Now, how this bird is treated today in the center of homophobia, which is, uh, which is always trouble, in, 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 uh, which is always caused by, not always, but in this part of the world by uh, uh, homophobia, and this was a nice gay cartoon uh, saying, if and if they, uh, if they were gay, I would have beaten their heads off. As you know, gay, uh, gay pride. Sorry. Uh -huh. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, uh, you know, when, when democracy arrived, what, there is no better word to call it uh, otherwise than, than democracy uh, in, in Eastern Europe. After the first, let's say, 10 years, homophobia was not so strong in the region. And then if you are to expect that it will be better and better, it's not. 20 years after the introduction of democracy, 
homophobia in all Eastern European societies, not only them, but I keep with, uh, with the field, is, uh, is, is, is stronger. You know what Putin thinks about, about uh, gay marriages and, and uh, gay and lesbian or queer issues in general, and so on. So uh, there is, uh, and the gray rela gay relation to the nation, as far as I know, is rather critical. Now, we come to the issue of ethnical cleansing via rape, which happens in every war, but in Yugoslav wars, uh, in, or, or war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia uh, uh, as well, women, a raping of women was, was used as, uh, and war, and as a war means. And uh, Jenny Holtz, Holzer, Holzer in, uh, sorry, in 2006 made this three-day Three night installation where she projected on the monument to the Battle of Nation, this is a Volkerschlacht Schlacht Denkmal in Leipzig, uh, the German monument, the highest in Europe. She projected three by, by a laser, uh, uh, by the means of the laser, three type of sentences on this militarist monument. Uh, she uh, used the material she used in, in uh, the material she already employed in her uh, in her piece uh, last Lust Mord, last Mord from '93, where she used uh, from interviews of the rapers, of the victims, and of the observers their comments about rape. It was spectacular installation. I'm sorry I didn't see it because this. Texts also mirror in the in the in the basin in front in front of the monument. Uh, another implicitly referring to Yugoslav wars, but not necessarily, Sanje Veković deals with one aspect of war memories, and this is the way how women remember war and women's memories are different from from men memories. Uh, she worked with the symbol of uh, state of Luxembourg or city of Luxembourg and this is this uh, monument de souvenir uh, topped with the allegory of victory or Nike which is locally called Gelefra, golden frau. When she visited the uh, Luxembourg first time she wanted to do something with the sculpture and at that moment she called her work, which was not realized then, by later, pregnant memory. Then, in 2001, she was invited by Enrico Lunghi to, to realize the project with this within a uh, national exhibition about Luxembourg history. So, Iveković produced a copy or reenacted the original monument. Make this work did it's exactly made the difference between official history or history and memory. Iveković did not question the monument, which was built uh, to honor Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg's men who joined international voice forces in the First World War. They volunteered. Then also, uh, they, they, were also they also volunteered in the Second World War and also were members of the uh, French Resistance. Uh, that there were also women in French resistance, completely forgotten in Luxembourg's official history, was, for instance, this uh, 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 flower uh, gesture uh, dedicated to women who were members, who were members of La Resistance, but were nowhere mentioned. Also, they were, they were, it was, it was, it made, it was one psychologist said, it was the best couch ever for, for the nation, you know? And plus, uh, you know, a foreigner, somebody who is not us, you know, point to, 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 to this problem of, of uh, memory. Uh, just a second. Uh, just a, a, a short, short, a short comment, two short quotations about war memorials and memorials in general. In general uh, 
yeah, Cynthia Enloe discussing post-colonial context has very, very nice funda fundamentally feminist statement because she, she claims that nationalism, uh, nationalism traditionally have uh, sprung, uh, typically sprung from masculinized memory, masculinized humiliation, and masculinized hope. That connection between women and war is explained by another uh, feminist historian in this way. That after biological reproduction, war is, perhap war is perhap perhaps the arena where a division of labor along gender lines has been most obvious, and thus where sexual difference has seemed the most absolute and natural. The separation of front and home front has not only been the consequence of war, but has also been used as its justification. And as we know from the Second World War and from many other wars happening uh, in today's world, at the home front, women, uh, women are active in many, uh, in many ways, but they, they are also fallen as wall, uh, war victims and I mean, try, if somebody knows, please tell me if there are any, if in any place on the world there is a, mon a monument for a raped woman in war or, or in, uh, in, in general or for home violence. There are no such monuments. Then this work, I cried when I saw it first time, is uh, uh, made by uh, Regina Jose Galindo, artist from Guatemala. Quien puede borrar las huelas? Huelas. Who can erase the trace? It, it was it was held uh, in the city of Guatemala. It lasted uh, one hour, but I will show you only. Uh, how do I get to the film? I will show you only one minute, which I have stolen fr from from YouTube. So this is constitutional court in, in the city of Guatemala. When you see such a work, of course, as we are all here in the age of globalization, always dealing with the so-called politics of the place, we have to know the, uh, the background. And when I saw this piece, I started a little bit to, to study history of Guatemala since I was so focused on my wars back home. You just forget that there were wars parallelly later or, or, or before uh, in other places of the world. And I always uh, remember Sir, uh, oh God, famous British ex actor who once said, oh God, Peter Justinov, who once said, peace is a war happening someplace else. So 
if we see now what is happening in, in Egypt, you know, you, you, you understand what I mean. Uh, who can erase these traces uh, deal with the following situation? Uh, uh, Jose Efran Monti, who was uh, somebody during his reign and the civil war, notorious practitioner of genocide, took part in presidential election in order to become a president. So the artists, no, I, I still have a couple of minutes. So the artist works from the Congress, uh, from, the, from the Constitutional Court to the Congress building, you saw the soldiers, and making, in fact, if you, if you allow me, a monument to the victims who were not necessarily the women, but most of them were women who uh, died during this, this period. Uh, Latin American uh, feminists complain sometimes that we watch at Latin America, Guatemala and some neighboring countries only as places where people are killed, you know, but uh, this, this fact is not so present in, in, in our global uh, histories. And so I'm always touched when, when artists, I mean, it's a little bit pathetic story, but I was touched when I saw this work, when I see that, that how artists really make this political gesture. By the way, forgot to say that she uses uh, human blood uh, in, uh, in, in this piece. Now, with this piece, I have only one more. Uh, with this piece, we come to another uh, important point that Ernest uh, Renan, or Renan uh, found crucial for the nation. And he uh, writes that, uh, that besides common suffering, and I quote, forgetting, is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation. Unity is always affected by means of brutality, yet the essence of a nation is that individuals have many things in common, but also they have forgotten many things, and he gives a perfect example. Every French citizen has to have forgotten the night of Saint Bartolomeo. In 15, uh, in, from 1572. In 20th century, Germans have, uh, in, uh, in, in the 20th century, Germans have to fa have forgotten the Holocaust, and not only Germany, Austria, uh, Baltic states, Serbia, Croatia, have to forgotten their col collaborations uh, with, with the Nazis during which Jewish population was killed, but not only Jewish, Roma people, communists, and so on. And French had to forget Vichy. Uh, you in Austria, you know what you should have, you should forgot. My Serbs will one day try to forget the genocide they performed in Srebrenica against Muslim men, where a paramilitary and official Serbian army killed about 8,000 Muslim men. Ob the massacre was observed by international community who didn't have a right to act, and so on and so on. So, uh, what this thinks that a nation or nation state has to forget is what one of my favorite German artists, Jochen Gertz, called the negative past. Nations like to remember their positive past, you know, like victories and so on. Victories are always, and the constitutions of many nation states was via wars, you know, with the neighboring nation. And this negative past was addressed by German artists in the 80s, you know, when they were minimal, minimal project, and in a certain way, uh, Mayalin, uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Vietnam uh, veteran memorials in, in LA was probably one of, probably for me, the best monument in the world addressing uh, Vietnam War, but not Vietnamese people. It addressed, uh, this memorial in Washington addressed 
American victims or heroes who had fallen in, in the war. And since there is a nice comment by one, uh, uh, I think, Polish author who reflects this 80s and the situation today, uh, and who remarked, Mark uh, Jarzombek, I think it's a proper pronunciation, uh, he uh, wrote, uh, and I quote, initially, the alternative language of commemoration was created in opposition to the efforts of the state, also through some artistic project in public space. But this is certainly no longer the case. The Holocaust Memorial in Berlin and the 9-11 Memorial in New York are evidence to the fact that the distinction between a memorial and the so-called counter-memorial of the 80s uh, has started to disappear. The state nowadays is interesting, interested in themes of trauma or trauma, having recognized the political advantage of victimhood. And this, of course, allows metaphysics to crawl back in its accustomed place, like in older memorials. One event, this is my, okay. In relating to Raman Hobi Bada, who is always useful to quote, uh, in his famous text, Dissemination, uh, makes this conclusion. It is to this syntax of forgetting or being obliged to forget that the problematic identification of national people becomes visible. It is this forgetting, a minus of the origin, that constitutes the beginning of the nation's narrative. Not all events in history of a nation are very important. This is the last piece I show. Dan Perzovshi, who performed in this piece in Bucharest, one event from recent Hungarian history. And this event happened some six months after Ceausescu was removed and killed after you know Romanian revolution took place in December uh, 89. Six months later, they had to have a first presidential election in a, uh, in a post-communist period where intellectuals, there was there was a certain uh, proclamation of Temiswara, which is a town in, in, uh, in Hungary, that they uh, demanded that communists, or former communists, including this President Anilescu, who was the first president after Ceausescu, should be prevented from holding official functions. Nonetheless, president took part in the election, uh, scheduled for 20th of May, but since March, people in Bucharest demonstrated on the, this is the most important place in Bucharest, the University Square, where they, it was peaceful demonst demonstration, non-violent, but it lasted 52 days. Then, government, Romanian government, invited miners from South Romania to come to Bucharest and fight uh, students and intellectuals who were protesting. This event was called Mine Riada. I, I don't know what it means in Hungarian, but I think it refers to mines. And it was terrible clash in, a, let's say, six months old post-communist society, uh, in which also uh, Romanian or Bucharest police took place. In his memorial to this event, Dan Terzovshi, within a project, Public Art Bucharest, co-curated with Marius Babias from Berlin, uh, performed, I think, one or two hours a day this situation over two weeks, where he made this memorial to Historia Hysteria. And you know, this event could be, you certainly know, uh, uh, Probably you have, I mean, we must have seen the Jeremy uh, Deller's uh, uh, reenactment of the, of the Battle of Ogrive in, in, uh, taking place in Britain in, 86, in 84 during the Thatcher regime, where uh, miners, uh, British uh, miners from Yorkshire 
had clashed with police, and the artist Deller reconstructed this scene with some also earlier participants as a clash, you know. So you see like a little civil war on the street, but Perzhovshi uh, reconstructed, uh, reenacted this violent clash through very, very peaceful action. And then I read in one uh, Romanian review about event, one younger person, I think it was a girl, who saw this, he said, uh, he saw two person, one policeman and the other, he said, why don't they fight, you know, because this was the original event. Good. Now, this is the last, uh, the last uh, slide. I had much more, but I could not show it to you. And this is, uh, Rosalind Deutsche book was my second communist manifesto about public art. I don't know, you certainly had to, to know it. And then she writes that art that is public participates in or creates a political space and is itself a space where we assume political identity. If we can understand what artists try to transfer to us. This is all. Thank you very much. <laughs>